Breakthrough of the Year 2022 in Engineering and Technology. Breaking the wall of plastic waste. How to program plastic degradation by enzymes. Ting Shu, University of California, Berkeley. On November 9th, 1989, I was trying to discover my own identity and who I want to become. Good morning, everyone. It is a rare honor for me to be here. And equally important is, it's so wonderful to see everyone in person, have this random conversation, and just let it go wherever you need to. Pandemic has changed all of us. And for me, it changed the way how I see my relationship with the world. I spent the time in Maui with my family when the island was mainly shut down. And it really gave me an opportunity to get close to our mother nature. We spent time at the beach, we see how the reef came back, and we also get countless encounters with marine life. But what struck me the most was a conversation with my son. He would tell me, Mommy, I saw a whale today. Mommy, I swim with the eagle ray today. And one day, there was a gentleman walk ahead of us. And he told me, Mommy, I saw a human. This tells you from a six-year-old boy's view, we are categorically just part of nature. And as a polymer scientist, I just cannot help to think about the plastic land we have on top of the ocean. As we witness how powerful nature, Mother Nature can be, as we enjoy the beauty of it, the question we have to ask ourselves is why our Mother Nature cannot digest those wastes. Is there any way that by combining human ingenuity with the power of Mother Nature, perhaps we can reach harmony. So the question, the first thing we ask ourselves is that if you have a banana peel, have a food waste, you dump it into sight, mother nature can easily digest it, convert it into something extremely useful. But when it comes to plastic, it can't. Why? Is that because the plastic was synthesized by ourselves using petroleum source? Or is it because that plastic doesn't exist in nature, we need to design callus under similar conditions to make them? And if that's the case, why we have no trouble to use biodegradable plastic for our biomedical applications? You go into doctor's office, you had a surgery, you have a suture, you never need to go back. It automatically dissolved. You can have an implant. And many of those plastics are also derived from petroleum sources. They are synthetic made. So there is a gap we have to fill. So this is where we ask ourselves, is it possible for us to build a synergy between Mother Nature, and in this case, we're particularly using lyse enzyme, and then to control when and how and where those enzymes can go through a chemical transformation of the plastic eventually we're going to reach harmony with our mother nature. Instead of for plastic to become a waste, it become a very important resource. So let's start to think about where the gap falls. This is a nanoscience problem. First of all, as you begin to look at the enzymes, that's what the tools, that's a catalyst our mother used to go through chemical transformations. It doesn't matter if it is a food that just in your track, or when we die, we can wrap ourselves back into the soil. And that is a nanoscopic object. By itself, it's a few nanometers to tens of nanometers in size. Now let's look at a synthetic counterpart, which is plastic. Plastic, by nature, is hierarchical structured materials. If you go down the length scale, look at in the atomic level, it contains the molecules, contain the atom, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, in many ways similar as what you see in nature. But as you continue to go up length scale, in particular when you get into a nanometer scale, plastic are organized in a very specific way. 
most plastic or semi-crystalline material, that's what we call them. That means that part of them is like dried spaghetti. They are densely packed, form crystalline domain, that's what we call it. And a part of it, just like boiled spaghetti, that wrapped around their random, that's what we call amorphous domain. And the arrangement of the hard crystalline and soft melting random arranged it's happened to be in the few nanometer to tens of nanometer. Keep that lens scale, because that is a lens scale where the enzyme is existing. So enzyme by itself is nanoparticle, and plastic is hierarchical structural materials with characteristic nature at nanometer scale. And of course, when you keep going on, you can pack the plastic polymer chains down into a macroscopic level, and you keep going up, that's eventually become the plastic bag in our hand or the spoon. So now, our question is to ask, how are you going to engineer a nanoscopic enzyme to function in this hierarchical structure, the long polymer chain, in a way that you can control? But yet, enzymes are evolved not to function on the long chain. It's evolved to function on the small molecule, which is extremely powerful. We just have to fill up the gap. So the first gap we'll have to fill up is the enzyme has to function inside of the plastic. Again, enzyme is not evolved to function inside of plastic. It's evolved to function in a biological aqueous environment. So this goes back to the work we did a few years ago. That's where we developed this UV degradable protectant. And that protectant does three things. It provides this local microenvironment to keep enzyme alive. And it also helped mediate its interaction with plastics, with its local environment, such that the enzyme can be nanoscopic dispersed. And then the added benefit down the road, we're going to explore that wrapper can turn on and turn off the enzyme as you see fit. A very important handle down the road. So once you get it to keep it alive, nanoscopic dispersed, the rest become an inside job of the enzyme. And I do want to point it out, I want you to take a look at the last picture and look at the lens scale, the scale bar down there. Those are nanoporous holes. Those holes are formed because the enzyme are chewing away the plastic around it. When you can nanoscopic disperse the enzyme inside of the plastics, you have many of them working for you. And that's, you get this plastic to really degrade from inside out. Then, if that's the case, we're done. So we should have a coffee break. This is just a start. Because you are now making the plastic in order to degrade it. You want to make it to use it. So there's a lot of caveat that goes in there. Let me go just give you a few examples. First of all, how plastic degrade matters. And let me show you two examples. If you look at the inside of the plastic, you have the enzyme. The green one is going to chew the spaghetti from the end, and then convert a long polymer chain into a small molecule. As I mentioned to you, that biology knows how to handle the molecule, and the bugs, the microbes around, they love it, because that serves as their food. But what do you see a lot of times is those red balls. The red balls, the enzyme, they just cut up that spaghetti, in, maybe somewhere in the middle. It's turned to a long chain into a short chain. It is a still a plastic. And in fact, if you end up getting those a lot of red balls, you're going to accelerate the formation of a microplastic. That's not what you want. Instead, you want to have the green ball that come to the chain end, bite it one time, one monomer, a few monomers at a time, you convert it into a small molecule. And this is exactly what you see. Okay? If you look at the green dots, those are the mass spectroscopy results. And the, what you see is we get monomer, dimer, and trimer. They're all less than $500, a 500 Dalton molecular weight. So they are perfect food for the microbes. Another beauty it comes down to is that as plastic degrade, they are going to form small, small pieces. And then once the enzyme hold on to that chain end, grab into the spaghetti, it will not let go. So even though it formed these small little pieces, they're floating around, you may not see with your eyes, the enzyme are still contained inside here. So that's what you see as green, the enzyme are labeled. So the enzyme continue to work till they run out of food. 
And that's where you can get a really high extent of, of uh, conversion. What else? Again, I mentioned to you that we're making plastics not to degrade it. We have to use it. We have to process into the material. So there is a window. They have to not be degraded you, till you're ready to trigger it. And this is exactly what we design. Thermodynamically, we really go back and look at what are the governing factors for the kinetic of degradation process and what the thermodynamic driving force. But balance it, this really open up a possibility for it to modulate the window when the plastic is going to degrade. And in this case, we're using biodegradable plastic as an example, and we want them to get to compatible with existing industry composting facility. That is from 40 to 60 degrees. And that's, if you look at it, the y-axis, that's the degradation rate, the x-axis corresponding to the temperature. We manipulate it so the system goes in that, right in that window. But you need two triggers. One trigger is not enough because you really narrow the application window. So if you do that well, so this is uh, a warm water, about 40 degrees. You put water, put temperature, two triggers together, and the plastic is degrading. And if you can visually see it's getting into small pieces, eventually disappear, and if you pull out your mass spectrometer, you get a small molecules. And are we ending there? No, we are not. Plastic waste is the tip of the iceberg. If you look at the periodic tables, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen are the main atoms. But what about the rest of elements in the periodic table? They cost much more energy than plastic, to be honest. And health-wise, heavy elements are much more hazardous in comparison to the plastic. I know that can you know, potentially be uh, controversial, but the reality is that we have to really go beyond just plastic waste. We have to, for example, look at electronic waste. Not only just from the resource recovery, but also think about our next generation and those two years to come. If you contaminate the groundwater, if you contaminate the soil, you really have a hard time to recover it. And this is where we decide to go with something, expand a little bit, just using the technology we have. We use that as a bounder to start to formulate a conductive ink and use them to print out a plastic electronics. And in this case, we actually print it out right on top of biodegradable plastic. You can see once everything is done, we do exactly the same thing as we always do for the plastic waste. They dissolve, and then we recover not only polymers, but also the metal fillers. So I am going to end my talk using this last slide. And this is really how I see our work. It's just as a start. We are nowhere close to the end. This is not a job that is already done. Historically, if you look at the plastic, the first concept was raised by Hermann Staudinger, 1920. So plastic by itself is only a little bit over 100 years old. It is a very young science. And we are yet to find out, unfortunately find out in a very painful way. Over 100 years from the beginning that you cannot make micromolecule, you cannot make a plastic, to now nearly 400 million tons of plastic being produced every year, and the number is going to keep going. The accumulated number is going to be massive. Use the power of the nature and let nature help us. Let us help nature. Eventually, we can reach harmony. This is, should not just limit it to biodegradable plastic. And in many cases, plastic probably shall not be degraded. A lot of energy goes into making them. You can go through a chemical transformation. And the one thing I think is going to be extremely interesting is to really look at how our body metabolizes effect. It's a very useful source of energy. Maybe plastic one day can be used that way. Thank you.